Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Sober Yoga Girl. I am delighted to have Nancy McKay sitting with me here today. And Nancy is all the way in Colorado, so on the other side of the world. And Nancy is a resilience and recovery specialist. So welcome, Nancy. How are you? Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Nice to have you and nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. So tell me a bit about yourself. I know that you're based in Colorado, um, but tell me what else kind of makes you unique. Well, let's see. You know, it is so nice to be here, Alex, and I appreciate the opportunity. I grew up in Colorado. Mm -hmm. So I've been here all of my life with the exception of four years spent in the Pacific Northwest, which really feels like home to me. Um, it's... It, it's a very odd thing. When I landed in Portland in 1987, I felt like I was going home for the very first time. And unfortunately, my mother uh, became ill in 1991, and I moved back to Denver at that time to, you know, moral support and so on and so forth. And never really intended to stay, but I have. So... <laughs> So I've spent most of my life here, and I was raised in a high-functioning alcoholic household. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, um, you know, there, there was a level of trauma right. just by not, you know, my, my parents, you know, f by and large did a great job. But it's interesting when your parents aren't completely present because they're under the influence of alcohol. Yeah. And so not only was it, I learned to walk on eggshells because you didn't want to um, upset anyone, right? Because that's, you know, and it, if they were drinking at the time, then that could become volatile. Um, right. And, you know, God forbid you did anything like that. But, but also you learned that, or at least I learned that I couldn't really depend on my parents. You know, when the chips were down and I had a, f a few instances where I needed them and they could not be there physically or emotionally. And so when that happens, that sets you up for a high stress baseline, I guess is kind right. of what, what I'm trying to say. And, and so I never felt at home there because I never felt like I could really relax. You know, I felt like I was always on guard, you know, and it was just, it was uneasy. You know, it was how I know a lot of people grew up, you know, right, um, right. in a, you know, and, and I'm not saying that I didn't grow up in a loving household, but to have your parents not be present literally and figuratively is a traumatic difficulty. And, you know, again, there was, you know, I wasn't beaten or, but it's interesting how people relay trauma to really big, violent situations, you know, like war or <laughs> physical abuse or, you know, rape or, you know, big, big things. And trauma can be much more subtle and take place over a period of time and and have a very debilitating effect and so you know that's what happened to me and i learned a lot about this just by reading recently oprah winfrey uh her book with dr bruce perry about trauma and the the title of that book is what happened to you mm -hmm. and it's it's a fascinating book and it gave me a glimpse into how my childhood affected my life. And that's one of the reasons I also became an alcoholic. You know, I, not only was it in my genes, but it was how I learned how to cope with the fact that I was uncomfortable in my own skin and I didn't know how to depend on myself, let alone anybody else. I mean, you know, it was just, it was a, very convenient coping tool you know so i started drinking in high school and not heavily you know just on the weekend sort of thing and but it's 
the trajectory of it was, <laughs> was, you know, it wasn't automatic. I've heard a lot of, a lot of alcoholics tell their story and many will say, you know, from the first time I had a drink, I was off to the races. You know, I was, um, I, I, I was a blackout drinker from day one, you know, blah, blah, blah. And that wasn't my experience. My experience it from the time I was, you know, I think I was 16 or 17 when I started drinking and I was 52 when I quit. And so it, it took a long time for it to get out of hand. Right. But out of hand, it did get so. So tell me about that. How did your drinking escalate over time? So when I was in my 30s, um, when I moved to the Pacific Northwest, I remember distinctly um, one evening, I think I'd had company over the weekend. I, I think maybe I had a dinner party or something. And I may not remember exactly that, but I do remember the first time I poured myself a glass of wine by myself. And, you know, they, one of the, one of the questions when, you know, if you think you have a drinking problem, are you drinking alone? You know, <laughs> it's one of those questions. Right. And I thought, hmm, I'm pouring myself a glass of wine. I'm by myself. I'm not socializing. Do I have a problem? And that was the first time that that thought entered my mind. And then during that that period of time, those four years that I was in the Pacific Northwest, I was definitely drinking more. I was drinking in more risky ways. I didn't have as much accountability. And so, you know, I made some stupid choices and under the influence of alcohol. And so, you know, touch wood, I'm still, you know, yeah. I'm still here. I didn't die at that point, <laughs> you know, and, and I tried a few times, you know, but, but at that point, you know, it was just, I was, I was partying hard. And then I moved, moved back home and, you know, things tapered off, you know, because I was more responsible, you know, I, now I was, one of my mother's caregivers, you know, and, and that sort of thing. And so, you know, I put on my big girl panties and I, you know, I was still drinking, but I was being very responsible about it and so on and so forth. And then meanwhile, my father is getting sicker and sicker in his alcoholism as my mom is, is getting sicker and sicker with cancer. And right. he, my dad finally decided that he needed help about three months before my mom died. And amazingly, you know, I took him to the, to the ER to detox and, and amazingly, he stayed sober for three years while he was grieving the death of my mom and which is miraculous that it, it was nothing short of a miracle. And then, you know, then he got the idea in his head that he had been dry really long enough and he could probably go ahead and drink again without, you know, the wheels falling off, which of course didn't happen. The wheels fell off in a pretty short period of time, like within six months. And so, you know, back to rehab we went and that, that happened a few times. And then he ended up killing himself wow. in March of 2007. And that threw my drinking into overdrive. I went down the, the rabbit hole of guilt and I felt like I should have been there for him. You know, I should have seen the signs and I just felt guilty as hell. And my drinking really took off and it took two years for me to get into the same position that he was in. And one night after happy hour, my husband and I got home and I, before we had left, I'd finished off the little bit of Chardonnay that was in the wine bottle in the refrigerator. And I forgot to, you know, give him the heads up when we were on our way home, you know, we need to stop and get some more wine. And when we got home, I was just like, damn it. 
we forgot to stop and get wine. And he said, well, I think you've had enough. And those five words just threw me into a tailspin. And I went into the bedroom and slammed the door and proceeded to have one hell of a pity party. And that shifted into a very melancholy, everybody would be better off without me frame of mind. And I got my husband's handgun out of the nightstand and put it to my head and the damn thing wouldn't fire. <laughs> and I realized that and I couldn't figure it out. You know, I was drunk enough that I couldn't, I wasn't thinking clearly. And I almost called my husband into the room to have him help me. You know, what is wrong with this damn gun sort of thing. Then I realized, oh, it's the safety. As soon as I took the safety off, the gun fired. Unfortunately, it wasn't pointed at my head. So the only thing that got shot was an innocent pillow on the bed. Oh, my God. And that ended my drinking right there. As I like to say, and I've titled a chapter in a book about it, uh, I was standing at the intersection of desperation and grace. You know, something saved me. And I just, I knew that I could never drink safely again. And so as much as I didn't want to, because I really, I felt like it was the most demoralizing thing ever would be to have to go to AA. I called one of my neighbors who had been watching my progression <laughs> in alcoholism go and uh, she had left me little breadcrumbs, you know, you can always ask me for help. So I called her the next day and said, I, I need help. And she took me to my first couple of meetings. And that was my last drink was on Friday, the 13th of March, 2009. Wow. Oh, what a story. Yeah, you know, I have to say it's a pretty good story. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a powerful story. Yeah. And it's one that I hope by my telling it, um, people won't have to get to that point. Mm -hmm. And they will understand what alcohol is doing to them before they almost lose their lives over it. And, um, you know, we all need to understand that alcohol is a, is a poison. It really is a poison. And um, it's marketed not to be a poison. And when we ingest it, it affects our brain matter and it affects how we think. It lowers our inhibitions. It increases our risk taking. And, um, you know, it just and it that has been proven time and time and time and time and time again with my own behavior. I mean, I did things that I would never consider doing in a sober state of mind while I was drunk. And I mean, really and truly, I've been so lucky that I never died doing any of those stupid, stupid things up until the last really stupid thing I pulled, and that was the gun. So it's, it's really important for people in general, but women specifically to understand how the alcohol companies are, you know, they have you in their sites <laughs> as far as marketing goes and making sure that you know that life isn't worth living unless you've got a glass of champagne or something in your hand, you know, a beautiful glass of wine that, you know, is dewy on the outside and just, you know, they romanticize the hell out of it. And they don't want to take any responsibility for the consequences and the lives that are being lost every year from the results of alcohol and, you know, alcoholism, let alone people getting behind the wheel of a car, which I did many times. I'm ashamed mm -hmm. to admit it, but I did it many, many times and, you know, never got a DUI. You know, I never su suffered any consequences other than... <laughs> other than my own, my shame and guilt and self-hatred for not being able to manage something that, that I 
thought was manageable that I had used to, you know, argue with my parents about, you know, how come you can't stop after just one or two? You know, now I understood, you know, I understood that because that was me, you know, it was like, okay, now, now I get it. <laughs> But I didn't understand what that was until after I got sober and started my recovery process. So what did your recovery process look like? You said you went to AA. Um, were there any I other did. tools that you used? Not really. I mean, I, I read a lot. The day after Friday the 13th, um, I sat on my patio drinking lots of coffee and smoking lots of Marlboro Lights and reading every book I had purchased up to that point about drinking. Because, you know, I knew I had a problem yeah. for a long time, but I never read any of those books because they scared the hell out of me. You know, I was like, oh, now I've got the information. Now I need to quit. You know, it's like I wasn't ready to quit. And so, so I gathered all those books and I sat on my patio and I read all day long and understood that, that I have a problem that can be corrected. You know, there is a solution and it's not at the bottom of a bottle of Chardonnay. <laughs> and so I was, you know, as I said, I was full of shame and guilt and especially because I had tried to kill myself, but but also there was this little glimmer of hope that things could get better. And so I went to AA every day for over a year. Um, I got a sponsor. I did what I was told. I, you know, I did the steps and all the things, right? And then I got a really good job after about, uh, I think I was four, no, 13 months, a little over a year sober, got a really good job started slacking off on my meetings a little bit. You know, I went to a few downtown and then I found a, a new home group that I started going to every Saturday morning religiously for years and made some incredible friends and that I still have to this day. I mean, I, I'm very connected. But the one thing that struck me is that, you know, and I certainly, you know, AA saved my life. And it's an incredible organization and it wouldn't still be around, you know, almost a hundred years later if it didn't work. Right. So it works. You know, there's no question if you, if you work the program, you can get and stay sober. However, <laughs> I feel like the anonymity of the program, which is at its core, at its foundation, and I respect that except for the fact that I felt like, I feel like the anonymity keeps the stigma alive. Yeah. And so, and the stigma kept me drunk for a long time because I didn't want to admit that I was an alcoholic, that I went to these meetings, that I, you know, I, I was ashamed of being in AA. And so for me, it was like, okay, um, you know, I was afraid that people would find out that I was an alcoholic, that I went to AA. Um, and then I started realizing that also we're only as sick as our secrets, you know? And so if I've got a secret like that, that's going to gnaw at me. And something like that could make me drink again, right. you know? And so now that I have, you know, 12 and a half years of sobriety behind me, and now I've got lots of coach training behind me that, that really emphasizes mindset and how our thoughts create our reality, you know, my, my mission is to shatter the stigma of alcoholism and addiction and to really make people aware that, that drinking is the abnormality and 
being in a sober state of mind is how we were created. <laughs> you know, we, we don't have to drink to have fun. You know, that was the first thought that I had when I realized that I couldn't drink anymore. I was like, okay, well, no more fun for me. You know, that's it. I will never have fun again. And, you know, that's a load of BS. And so it's just um, helping people understand that. And, you know, if you're a normal drinker, you know, that's fabulous, you know. And I vaguely remember the days of being a normal drinker, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, because I did, I do, I think I have that genetic gene, you know, mm -hmm. that, but I also know that if you have a problem and you're looking over your shoulder, hoping that nobody figures that out, then that's something that you really want to look at. And, yeah. and, you know, the question is, why don't you want anyone to figure that out? And what is it about that? You know, what is it about your over drinking that worries you? You know, and if you're worried, why? And if you think you might have a problem, you probably do. Because normal drinkers don't wonder if they have a drinking problem. It doesn't even cross their mind. Right. Right. And so when we get to the point where we think, hmm, I wonder if, yeah, you probably do have a problem. And that's the time to address it, not when you have a gun pointed at your head. And so, you know, in my effort to shatter the stigma and help women understand that there is a better way and that they don't have to be a prisoner in their, in their mind uh, and be obsessed with alcohol. They, they don't have to live that way. And that's a hell of a way to live. I mean, it's just, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, being in that obsession, when, when, when do I get to drink? How much, what time is it? You know, it's gotta be four o'clock somewhere. Um, you know, what do I get to drink? When do I get to drink it? And for how long? And I'm awfully glad I don't live that way anymore. So, so tell me about how you got into coaching. How did you become a coach? So about six years after I got sober, I was still in this, this wonderful job. And I was um, diagnosed with ovarian cancer on my 58th birthday. I was fortunate. I was very, very fortunate that they caught it early. I had a, you know, several months earlier, I had doubled over in pain thinking I was having an appendicitis attack. And it was well, they said it was a fibroid tumor at that point. I don't believe that that was the case, but at any rate. <laughs> so a few months later, they we did another ultrasound and turned out that it was a mass. And so on my birthday, I had surgery. It was either my birthday or my husband's birthday. So I decided to, you know, take one for the team and and have surgery on my birthday. And I had um, stage 1C ovarian cancer which is, it's very rare that they catch it that early. Mm -hmm. um, and, and ovarian cancer is a very deadly disease because usually by the time they catch it, you're in stage three or four and that's, you know, that's not good. So, so they caught it early. I went through six rounds of chemo kind of as an insurance policy. And um, I realized a few things going through chemo. Um, a, how, how lucky I was. Um, B, how many people really cared about me, which I wasn't really aware of. And after a while, my perspective on life began to change. And, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't happy in my job anymore. Um, I kind of had hit the limit of where I could go. And my mantra became, I didn't get sober and survive cancer to be miserable. And so I had been doing a bunch of reading and personal development. I'd been studying Brene Brown. And, um, and then I came across Martha Beck, who 
I'd read before um, her column in Oprah Winfrey magazine, but I hadn't um, read any of her books. And then she wrote a, a book called Diana Herself. It was a work of fiction, which was her first. And it just felt like she wrote it just for me. <laughs> you know, it just, I felt like the woman in the book was just like me in many, in many ways. And it shifted something for me. And I knew I needed to learn more about that. And so after I went to a workshop that she held in California, I signed up for her coach training program. And um, the year before that, I had actually uh, gone through the Institute for the Psychology of Eating, which was fascinating, but it didn't really help me become a coach. Right. Um, great information. But and then so then through Martha's class, you know, her coursework, I became a certified Wayfinder life coach. And then I became a certified Equus coach. And so I use horses as co-facilitators to help really horses really speed up the process as far as, you know, getting to the root of what's going on and, and helping people transform. That's my favorite model of coaching to, to use is working with horses. Um, but, you know, coaching and just helping women realize that they can have so much more if they, you know, the key is to look inside and find your inner wisdom, as Martha likes to say. And, and so I repeat it. Um, I'm not going to tell you anything you don't already know about yourself. If you take the, the time and get quiet enough to look and look inside and, and listen to your heart, you have all the answers that you need. I just help you uncover them. And, you know, it's just such an honor to work with, with the clients that I've worked with and, you know, hopefully make it, you know, make a difference for them. And, you know, like I say, working with women who are, are worried about where their life is going because of their drinking is, is huge for me. And so I have a question for you. If you had any advice for anyone who wanted to quit drinking, what advice would you give? Well, the first thing I would say is um, don't do it alone, mm -hmm. really, you know, for a couple of reasons. One, if you're drinking really heavily, you absolutely shouldn't do it alone. You should do it with medical supervision. You know, if you're, if you are drinking 24 seven, it will um, be very dangerous for you to quit cold turkey, right. you could really, detoxing by yourself is not a good idea. Now, like when I quit, you know, I wasn't a 24-7 drinker. I was a everyday drinker, but I usually was able to wait until four o'clock in the afternoon before I started drinking. And, you know, then I was in bed by nine at the max, you know, <laughs> so it was five hours a day. But, you know, I was, I, you know, I was hung over every day and I had the shake so bad I couldn't put my eyeliner on and, and right. all of that fun stuff. But I didn't have to detox medically. You know, it was just a matter of, you know, I, I slept a lot for the first couple of weeks. But other than that, you know, I wasn't in any kind of um, physical danger out of detoxing. So, you know, the, I think the, the biggest thing that you need to look at is how how is detoxing going to affect you so don't do it alone and second you know is the other part of of getting help is it's so much easier when you have somebody to talk to about the process and so you know depending on you know i mean i highly encourage people to join aa because it works you know, and it saved my life and it's a fabulous program and I've got some fabulous friends from it, mm -hmm. but it's not for everybody. And so if it's not for you, don't keep drinking <laughs> like I did, you know, that's, I wasn't ready to go to AA. So I kept drinking. I didn't think there, were, there was any other choice. You know, I didn't think there was not an alternative. Now, you know, thank God, you know, we have 
sober curious movement, you know, and, yeah. and um, the gray area drinking is, you know, people are becoming more and more and more aware of the dangers of alcohol and the recovery community is exploding because so many people are using alcohol to cope with life's pressures, right? And so even if AA isn't your cup of tea, there's a lot of resources out there for you to, you know, find a community. And so find a community, call me, you know, happy to, <laughs> happy to help. Um, and, and then the next thing is, of course, put away the booze, throw it down the drain, get it out of the house, whatever. And um, really take the time to get to know yourself and, and be honest with yourself, maybe for the first time ever. You know, um, when you look at, at yourself and you're honest, that's where the magic happens. And that's also where having help um, is so critical is because having someone walk you through that, because some of the stuff that you're going to, that's going to come up is going to really be difficult. And unless you have someone like a sponsor in AA or a coach, um, it's hard to look at some of that stuff. Right. And get through it without feeling a, an incredible amount of shame. And there, you know, this is not a place for shame or judgment or anything else. It's, this is a place for um, inspiration and congratulations. And, you know, you get to, you get to start a whole new life now. And, you know, good for you. It's, it's exciting. You know, it's really exciting. Mm -hmm. Well, Nancy, thank you so much for being on the show. Honestly, your story gave me like shivers and goosebumps. And it's so inspiring to see like from where you started to where you are now and how you're helping people um, move through these challenges as well. It's, it's really inspiring. So thank well, you. Thank, thank you so much. I appreciate it. It was really nice visiting with you, Alex. Nice to chat with you too. And I hope that we meet again soon in the, uh, the sober world. Yes, me too. All right. Take care, Nancy. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.